So how is it that I can take a local model like 5.4 that isn't trained for tool calling and get it to work in real code? Now there are limitations because I am running this locally in LM Studio where I do actually need to override the system prompt, which I've talked about in previous videos. But I have had this conversation several times where people will come to me and say, hey, don't worry about this model. It'll get better once they have it working with tool calling. That is not the way Rue code works. So I want to break down a little bit and demystify really what tool calling is, different ways to do it. And then I want to show you some examples of how I'm actually using it in production, because I think it's actually very fascinating. So the first thing I want to talk about is Rue code works with non-tool calling models. And this is something that a lot of people have argued with me on. And it's relatively simple. Tool calling is nothing special. It's basically a wrapper around prompt engineering. So when you really think about it, there are two approaches. There are the via API ones, which when a lot of people talk about tool calling, it's function calling. It is done via API configuration. You can define your functions. You can basically orchestrate how the LLM and your computer or the, the client is actually talking to each other back and forth. Then there is the approach that root code uses, which is in-text tagging. Truthfully, I think there are pros and cons to both of these approaches. And I do plan to get into that because I think while in-text tags is phenomenal at giving you a wide range of capabilities, there is some downside to it. So I do want to call that out. Now, a little bit about approach one, which is pure function call it via API or some sort of configuration like this. If you were using the OpenAI client, this is what it may look like. You're going to define the tools. This is a very simple one from their documentation that basically you can define a function called get weather. What you then end up needing to do though, is you basically respond to the output and you're going to look to see if that function needs to be called on your end. So an example of this would be this, where you're going to execute that function code based on the response from the LLM. So it's going to give you the parameter that need to be passed in. It's going to give you the function that needs to be called. All of that's relatively easy, but it is work to orchestrate that. Like they're both, neither one of them is free. Now, when we go to the next one, we end up returning the result back to the LLM. So if you think about the flow here, what we end up doing is we end up having some sort of, uh, so we're going to have the user on this side and we're going to have the LLM on this side. And the user can be some sort of client or it could be you chatting with it. You're going to send a message to the LLM and then the LLM is going to basically want to request back some sort of function call. So it's going to say, hey, get weather. And then you're going to do the work for that. So you're going to call that function GW. Then when that result comes back, you're going to initiate the results back to the LLM. And then it's going to analyze it again. And then it's going to generate a response back. So all of this, if you are doing pure tool calling without any sort of like frameworks and things around it, this is what's happening. You're going to register the functions to the LLM and then the LLM is going to tell you when to call it and with what information. It's actually relatively easy because it's very structured and they follow the, a very similar pattern, right? So it's, there's really, I would say one of the pros about this approach is how structured it is. So going back to this example here again, you can see very clearly that we are basically appending the message back and we're telling it in particular the tool call ID. So it knows that that's the response from that tool call ID. But there is something else. Frameworks can simplify this a lot. So if you're using things like Autogen, it does an incredible job of kind of handling that back and forth for you. So you don't need to orchestrate it. And one of the reasons why I fell in love with Autogen early on was really its function call capabilities. This is one of my early prototypes that I built that basically had a bunch of function calls that would go and gather data that the LLM decided it would need. And it worked really, really good. But it does slow things down drastically, which is one of the downsides of this approach. 
because every back and forth that occurs is double latency, right? You've got a call there, the latency of the network traffic there, the latency of the LLM to respond. Then you've got to the latency of that message getting back to you, the, the client. Then you've got your response time, the latency there. Then you basically have, you know, on the way back up, the result being sent to the LLM. So one of the reasons why I ended up abandoning this approach was simply my users did not like waiting that long for a response. And this is one of those things that needed to be relatively quick. So tool calling drastically increases latency, the time to actually get to the final answer. Now, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't use it. And I think there are many cases where you should. So to carry on a little bit, if we talk about chat, in chat, you do not necessarily have to do tool calling the way I just showed you. You can create this language that the LLM can respond with. This is an example that I came up with and one that I actually use on some of my code, which is you build the tool tags and then you basically can pass in structure JSON in between the tool tags, parse that, and then do what you want with it. There is downside to this approach too, which I'll get into as well. Now, Rue code, this is specifically how they do it. They use kind of the XML based tag approach. I don't typically use the XML based tag approach in my own stuff. I found that a little bit more tricky uh, to manage than just having structured JSON in there. Now, root code was forked from Klein and the special tagging convention kind of came from it. And if you remember, it wasn't that long ago that tool calling via the API was super rare. So it goes to reason that the reason that Klein and Ruco did this is because they wanted to support a wide range of models without having this sort of vendor lock-in, this API lock-in. Really, if you were to go and dig into the prompts of Ruco, this is what it would look like. You would see tags like read file, the, the parameters that need to be there. In this case, it's a file name, and then the closing tag. And what ends up happening in Ruco code is it actually parses this knows how to respond to this and knows how to actually go and call the particular function or logic that's in root code to return that particular content back to the AI. So, the, so rather than having all of these back and forth, what we can do is now short circuit that because we are given chat inside of that chat response. There may be tool calls, tool call or two calls um, as part of that, then the AI knows what to do when that tool call occurs. Now in Ruco, they have a very special thing where they try to only do one tool call per chat. Um, I actually do have done something a little bit different in mine, and I think both both methods are are quite reasonable. This is an example of something that I would do. So I, I think this is important because I, I think it can give you an understanding of how you can actually prompt engineer some really amazing things. I believe they're amazing, but I built this, so I'm a little biased, to actually generate incredible output by AI without having to do so much back and forth. Now, there are times due to context limits that back and forth is valuable. And again, I'll talk, I'll talk about that a little bit here. So let me give you a quick demo of my product and how I do it. Now, this looks like any other chat window. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and click this button. This says, help me plan my marketing campaigns for next month. Now, in this particular case, what we're going to do is we're actually going to hit the LLM. I'm using a series of models here. But watch what ends up happening here. So over here on the right, this is my artifact view that opens up. It's You can see the JSON streaming in. I stream that in just so it feels you can feel it loading. Um, and then once it's done, I parse it into a format, a component that's very specialized for showing off the details here. So all of this is very, very like well styled. And I did this with no tool calling. The context is built, the rules are put together, the AI knows how to respond to it. And as part of that, I actually have a pretty, I'd say a pretty cool um, prompt manager that I've built that you can basically inject data tags into the prompt that you're using. 
and you can kind of seed whatever context you're in in the particular with the particular data you need and then you can very explicitly define the rules around the output and it's really a powerful mechanism to use this so let me give you another example here. so i'm in another version of mine so now let's say you've built your plan you now actually want to take all of these and, and kind of finalize the content on it you can see here that i actually have two tabs I can ask certain questions um, that I have kind of defined here, but this over here on the right is an editable document. And I can change this, save it, it gets passed back into the AI. I can also say generate an email off the brief. And what's gonna happen here is my AI, because it's seeded with the proper context here, because I'm, I'm actually going to be, I've given it the knowledge it needs to know to how to actually generate an email. I use a very, complex format for this because there's pieces that I put together so it's component based. Anyway, what it's going to do here is it's going to stream that in, turn it into HTML, and now we end up with a marketing email that's based off of that brief. And that's all done within the context of a single chat message. So I've kind of put together this document to kind of talk about it. Now, if we look over here on the left, we've got the tool calling, the tag based method. And then on the right, it's like the open AI function calling. Although now I don't even know if I can call it OpenAI explicitly anymore because there are a lot of models that also support, you know, similar tool calling. One of my favorite things is the model flexibility. You can use models that do not have to have the tool calling capabilities built into it, which is why Rue code, I can make work with local models that don't have that supported. Whereas OpenAI function calling or any sort of function calling, you sort of are required to have a model that supports that. It's very easy to, to set up, but you do need to do custom parsing. And that can be the trickiest part. So you need to build like the systems that kind of manage the tool calls coming in, how you parse the data coming out. Whereas just doing it via the OpenAI or whatever framework, it can make it a lot easier. And then if you layer in things like Autogen or ADK, it can make function calls way easier because it kind of manages a lot of that back and forth to you. Now, this is one of the performance things that you have to take into comparison here is when you're doing tag-based, it does use more tokens, but it is faster when it comes to latency. So that is the trade-off you're taking. And Rue code has taken the more tokens, but for speed approach. Whereas if you're doing a lot of function calls, it's going to slow down the entire output a lot. Now, the reliability, and this is something you see a lot of people complain about in root code is diffing and tool call failures. And a lot of that is because of this reliability issue. You end up with a little bit more, I don't want to say subjective, but it's not as structured. It's not as like formalized. So you can get errors in the output that the AI comes up with. I have guardrails in my system that actually checks and I, I run like minor cleanups or minor fixes, but if it totally fails, I just regenerate it again. But it's not as reliable, technically, it's not as reliable as just using a structured kind of tool calling method. But I don't have a lot of problems with it. I think this is kind of starting to go away more and more. And then for the vendor lock-in, something I really care about, you aren't locked into any particular model. You aren't locked into any sort of API pattern. You just need the AI through very clever prompt engineering to handle giving you the output that you want properly. Using this with local LLMs, it works better with a tag-based approach because a lot of local LLMs do not have tool calling functionality baked into it. All right, so jumping back over to this, I just want to say real quick, that there is just so much to learn in this space. And that's where today's sponsor comes in. And if you're like me and a hands-on learner, Brilliant is just a great place to go. Whether you're learning about AI or maybe regular programming or maybe how machine learning models work, Brilliant has you covered. I've been programming for more than 20 years and I find the advanced courses on Brilliant the right difficulty for me. Lately, I've been working my way through the data analysis one specifically on classification because it's so easy. I can load it up on my phone, do a few things, and then go to bed. 
And if you want to try this right now, there's no risk to you. You can click the link in the description or in the pinned comment and get a free 30 days to try it out. And if you agree to actually purchase, you'll get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Anyway, let's get back to the video. All right, so now back to it. Why use tag-based tools? So this is just a quick summary of it. I think the top five reasons for me are the model agnostic. You can use them in a bunch of different ways. Just crazy flexibility. I really like the transparent tool invocation because you control it. And anytime that I, I introduce more complexity, and to me, complexity is how you kind of intermingle and use other frameworks and things. It just ends up being, you know, it just ends up being a headache over time. The fourth thing would be the no vendor lock in. I'm not locked to OpenAI. I'm not locked to Claude. I'm using a bunch of different models. And then I really like to be able to control it with prompt engineering. I love having that control. And on the negative side, I think parsing and implementation can be harder, especially when you're first setting it up. And it can be kind of brittle. You need to be pretty good at kind of learning how to, especially if you're streaming in text, you saw how I'm streaming it in. I pick up that opening tag, I stream things in, I pick that closing tag up. That can be kind of complex to build. It's not trivial. You know, it's not also not incredibly hard, but it's not trivial. Then the other thing would be is like model compliance. In my testing, I have found that less capable models that are trained for tool calling follow the rules of tool calling a little bit better. Whereas if you have a less capable model and you're doing it via prompt engineering, they can go off the rails a bit more, ignore parameters. And you guys can see that very easily just by putting in a model into root code that's not very capable. You will see that it fails and it will do things like call try to call a tool without a parameter or put it in the wrong format. Very, very easy to see that. The other thing is that if you really are limited with your prompt overhead, which is the number of tokens, that's also a, a thing to maybe not use uh, tags for. And the fourth thing would be you don't have the structured output. Uh, you kind of have to formulate it in a way that allows you to kind of take this raw text, pull out the tool calls from it. So it's not as structured. So you are working with it a bit more here. So yeah, I think that's going to about wrap this one up. Hopefully this was helpful to you. And if it was and you learned something, please consider subscribing and hitting the like button. Otherwise, I would love to know your thoughts and opinions on both approaches of tool calling, whether it's clever prompt engineering or trying to use the more systematic way that are built into some of these frameworks. I think both have merits. Anyway, guys, until next time, peace out.